Gauruji, it's one o'clock. Shall I start or can we wait for a minute or two? Um, at your discretion, Shnantiji. Uh, take as much time as you need. I'm ready, so whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Namaste. Welcome to this session of Yoga Talks. Today's topic is Karma Yoga for Professionals by Gaurav Vastogi, entrepreneur and founder, Living Deeply Foundation. I'm very grateful that he has agreed to deliver this talk, and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes going over his skills and experience because they relate to the topic that he has chosen. Um, as usual, I would like to mention that this program is put together by Integrated Cultures ACT and Integrated Women's Network with the support of the High Commission of India, Canberra and the Ayush Information Cell Australia and also with the help and active support of yoga practitioners and speakers. Gauru Rastogi Ji is an entrepreneur with more than 25 years of executive experience. As a professional, Gauru Ji has led executive groups at large companies and has also founded and sold an AI startup. As a board men mentor, Gauru Ji works closely with business leaders that are driving business reinvention and sales transformation. Gauravji is originally from Delhi. He did his undergrad in mechanical engineering from the Delhi Technological University and holds an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, uh, which is the number one uh, program in India for IAM. He's the author of three business books and several podcast episodes on the future of work. His forthcoming book discusses the relevance of Karma Yoga in the age of destruction and distraction. I'll send you a link to this book after the talk in our group. Gauravji is a dhyana, meditation and yoga teacher and has been teaching for more than 10 years in Silicon Valley. He has founded two learning not-profit organizations. He is frequently invited to speak at events and conferences on the practices and philosophy of yoga and Hinduism. Gauru Rastogi teaches the yoga of living deeply, an authentic yoga system designed for the modern world. At the Living Deeply Foundation, he has developed practical study guides based on the Bhagavad Gita and Vedanta philosophy, bringing this ancient wisdom into practical language. He is also a board member and dean at Hindu Community Institute, which has a unique program to teach and practice Karma Yoga. Gauruji loves to teach, write, and create wonderful things that make the world a better place. He lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with his family. I came to know Gauruji, and I've already heard his um, speeches. Uh, because of his role as Dean of the Hindu Community Institute. Once again, I express my gratitude to you, uh, Gauravji, for agreeing to recording in progress this talk on Karma Yoga for Professionals today for us. Namaste. Thank you. Namaskar, Riyantiji, and uh, thank you for inviting me over. Uh, namaskar to everybody else. Uh, good evening from California and good morning, to, uh, good afternoon to everyone in Australia. <clears throat> I'd like you to join me uh, in just centering ourselves 
um, so <clears throat> we're going to sit and I'm going to chant Om very gently three times and we're going to sit in silence uh, just observing the thoughts I'd like you to follow along if possible if you're able to chant if you're in a place where you're able to chant Om that's wonderful if not uh, it's still all right just pay attention to the sound I'd like you to bring your attention to the heart center. I'm going to lower the camera over here. Here, uh, right below the rib cage, right above the belly. Bring your attention here and stay right here. Pay attention to anything that goes on in this space. Inviting divinity to reside here in our heart center and, and being with us in our time together. So please join me. Please sit comfortably in any posture. Sitting in any posture. Sitting with the back straight. The back is straight but not stiff. Back, neck and head are in a straight line. Close your eyes gently and relax the expression on the face. Close your eyes gently and relax the expression on the face. Relax your shoulders. Relax your belly. As you breathe in, let the belly expand. As you exhale, simply let go. Breathing into the belly, let the belly expand. As you exhale, let go of all your thoughts. Let go of all your preoccupations. Breathing into the belly, let the belly expand. As you exhale, let everything go and feel a sense of lightness and freedom. Bring your palms together in Namaskar Mudra. Just pressing the palms together gently at the center of the chest. Touching the fingers together gently and gently touching the back of the thumbs into the chest. Stay right here. Bring your attention to the hollow space between the palms. Look for sensations, vibrations, energy. Right here in the palms. I'm going to chant Om three times and then we'll sit in silence for a few moments. Exhale completely, take a deep breath. Inhale. your hands in your lap. Eyes are still closed, back, neck and head are in a straight line and your attention is still at the heart center. Feeling a warmth, feeling gentle, pleasant vibrations, feeling a sense of space that was opened between us allowing for an energetic exchange of energy and ideas and conversations, allowing us to engage in a safe place. Look for that sensation somewhere around the heart center.
Now, before you open your eyes, rub your palms together gently to get some heat and then transfer that heat by covering your eyes with your palms and then blinking your eyes open and pull your palms back like an open book. Namaskar. My name is Gaurav Rastogi and uh, welcome back to uh, our conversation together. I will uh, try to keep my comments to about half an hour allowing room for questions and answers. And um, after that, if you have any questions or doubts or clarifications, you may type them into the chat window and I will pick them up at the right time. And if you are able to open your video, it'll help me see you. Otherwise, I am talking to myself, which is not an altogether unfamiliar state of being. So it's all right, even if your cameras are closed. Our topic today is a part of a series of conversations that are being organized around the International Day of Yoga. And yoga is ordinarily understood as postural yoga. Exercises and pranayam is sometimes included in that set of practices. But the world of yoga runs deep, very deep below it and above it. And, and today I'm, I'm exploring a different uh, but related branch of yoga, which is karma yoga, the yoga of action. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what what, what yoga is, what karma yoga is, uh, and then where it sits in the modern world. Um, my source for today's conversation is the Bhagavad Gita, which is a part of the Mahabharata in India. And I will uh, cite references. I'm not going to quote scripture and verse for today's conversation. For that, I have a longer class. I'm trying to keep this interactive and interesting for everyone. So let's first survey the world around us and understand the world that we find ourselves in today. We find ourselves in a world where um, everything outside that we perceive with our eyes seems to be undergoing some form of destruction. Societies are seemingly collapsing, filled with more anarchy every day. Um, the economic order is definitely changing and Things we learned at school about how the world works, how economies work, how politics work, how institutions work, how families work. Everything we seem to know see, is under question now. I live in California in the United States where uh, a, a popular but very um, involved question these days is what makes a woman a woman? Nothing that we knew firmly uh, earlier. Is there a squeaky sound? I do not know, um, not at my end, hopefully. There's nothing in my room that is squeaking. Um, if you are hearing it, we will find out an alternate way to uh, to speak. So please keep informing me if there is a squeaking sound. I will also check if there are some, nobody else's mic is on, so it's just probably me. Okay, um, so if it continues, I will try to make adjustments. All right, all right. So the world outside of our eyes, when we look out, everything seems to be under a severe form of destruction. You know, if you're a professional in the workforce and if you were, you know, 20 years ago, you were a banker. Well, who is a banker today? What is a banker? What is a hotelier? What is a, um, you know, what is a finance professional? What is a manufacturing person? What is a, uh, it's, Nothing that we seem to know about um, the external world seems to have any solidity to it anymore. A lot of flux, a lot of change. And so any sense of identity we might derive from the world outside is under tremendous uh, flux. There is no support or, or um, uh, con continuous uh, consistency in the world outside. And so you might think that you might people would take recourse to the inside world, the world of the self, the world of our thoughts, the world of our inner experience. And um, ordinarily that would be the case, but now computers and algorithms have become so smart at keeping us distracted and keeping us outraged that, uh, that we have no support inside either. We are uh, distracted, we are um, outraged, we have low energy, we have poor connections to not only each other, but to our own innermost experience. Uh, and, and so there is no support outside or inside. 
and we find ourselves at a place which is extremely unpleasant and uh, fearsome. Not too different from how at the beginning of the Gita, uh, Arjun finds himself, where he, if for those who may not be familiar with the outline, uh, the Gita sits in the, the great epic Mahabharat at the most climactic uh, uh, sequence, which is the battle between four and a half million people on both sides, basically a total of four and a half million people arrayed together, battle is about to begin, and the ace archer is having second thoughts about this entire enterprise of warfare, because what he sees in front of him are people that are related to him or have taught him and so on. So he, he does not feel that he needs to go through with this battle. And then he falls into the depths of despair. And the rest of the Gita is, is really Sri Krishna, who is, in this case, his driver for his chariot. Uh, but this is Vishnu himself in that form. He, uh, Sri Krishna advising him, giving him counsel, but not taking away his decision-making authority. He's not telling him what to do. He's telling him why he must do what he needs to do. But at the end, he says, do what you feel like. And naturally, what he feels like is he needs to go out and battle. And then the battle begins. That's the 18 chapters of the Gita. And, and so the world we find ourselves into is does not have the same stakes, perhaps, as Arjun does at Mahabharat. But it certainly feels that way. And if you see all the press about uh, you know, the world seems to be coming apart surely, but if you look even in the professional world, what is happening is quite stunning. Uh, there is the great resignation, which is um, about all the way around us. And people are leaving their jobs for new jobs or no jobs. It doesn't matter. They're just leaving. And the question is, why would that be the case? That would be the case because people are not finding meaning, purpose, joy, energy, or satisfaction in their work. A, the crisis that we are facing right now is not merely a financial or political or professional crisis. It's a spiritual crisis. People used to find meaning at work. It's not just a source of money. People find identity at work. People find uh, energy from the things that they do and the joy it brings uh, people uh, and so on. That is no longer available to people for reasons I've just described the destruction and distraction have created a fearsome wor workplace where there's no satisfaction in work. And in that situation, Karma Yoga is the yoga of our times. For professionals, Karma Yoga literally is the yoga of action. Uh, it's often misunderstood and because most of the Indian or Hindu um, uh, uh, speakers they talk about yoga and Vedanta topics tend to be renunciates, sannyasins, or people that have, uh, or um, Vedantins, which is people that have a lot of wisdom and are able to describe at great length the thing. So their schools of yoga that they're describing tend to be either uh, Jnana Yoga, which is wisdom, or Bhakti Yoga, you know, which might be a renunciate or a Vedantin describing it. And so not many speakers speak on behalf of Karma Yoga, which is a shame because Karma Yoga is, is a, a yoga or a, a means of approaching God that is available to all of us. Professionals, married, fathers, grandparents, everyone in this, in this world has access to all these aspects of Karma Yoga. So I'm going to talk about Karma Yoga from that perspective. Um, karma Yoga is uh, in is the yoga of action. Yoga itself means to, to join. What is, what is to join? It's to join the lower self. We usually say in yoga classes, it's to join the lower self to the higher self. What does that actually mean? It means to, to ex, you know, expand our sense of being from our individual situated in one body identity to the identity of God that animates this entire universe, that creates and breathes in and out this entire universe and all the other universes that might exist. To be one with that form, that being, and therefore to dissolve ourselves into the action that results from this union. That is Karma Yoga. Uh, in other words, you might say it is selfless service that nonetheless satisfies the self as well. 
right? That's that's karma yoga, and and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, to make it easier, karma yoga is a is a web of interconnected thoughts. So to make it easier, I'm going to use a mnemonic of a hand, and uh, and that way you can carry the messages back home. Uh, there are seven things I'm going to talk about briefly in today's exposition, uh, but you are able to carry it back on any one hand with you because there are seven things, and those seven things you're going to be able to see right on the hand, which is there is the the uh, the wrist where you typically wear a watch. There's the palm of the hand. There is the thumb and all the four fingers over there. So these are the seven things that we're going to talk through. Um, um, yeah, five fingers, the palm and the wrist. And so there's seven ideas. You can carry those ideas with you. There are more ideas that are involved in Karma Yoga, but uh, but for today's conversation, we're limited to these, these seven. Um, <clears throat> So why Karma Yoga? Let's talk about that first. Um, and before that, I have to, uh, to tell you that uh, when you approach Karma Yoga from outside, it's a combination of words not unlike jumbo shrimp, right? Which is to say, you know what the word jumbo means, it means extra large. And you know what the word shrimp means, it means a little, you know, tiny little thing. So jumbo shrimp seems like a contradiction in terms. And similarly, you might know the word karma, and especially out here in the West, we tend to think of karma as a system of retribution, divine or otherwise, where you do things and then things come back and bite you. And that is seen as the, the meaning of karma. It's not quite that in, uh, in the Hindu system, but that's the colloquial, that's what we understand commonly. In yoga, it is understood as postural or, uh, you know, or asana is usually thought of as yoga. But Karma Yoga is neither of these two. It's something completely different um, and, and more interesting than just a, a divine retribution, a system of divine retribution or a system of, uh, of, of bodily postures. Karma Yoga is the ability to, to find that space where the energy of the universe flows through us unimpeded without any, without any barriers where we feel a sense of satisfaction by serving selflessly, where we feel a sense of connection to all others, including ourselves, and a sense of joy permeates our being. You may say that to work in a state of enthusiasm is to work in a state of Karma Yoga. And I say that definitionally. The word enthusiasm itself quite literally means to be filled with God. The, if you break down the word, it literally means to be filled with God. So when you work enthusiastically, is it not the case that time seems to fly when you're working with enthusiasm and having fun? Is it not the case that you feel a tingly sense of excitement and a sense of joy, satisfaction, and a, and a sense of not quite being there? Uh, anyone that engages in a creative act, uh, you might already experience that where you're engaged in your art, whether it's singing or making something or designing, uh, whatever it is. And only at the end, you can look back and say, hey, did I do this? Because I don't remember doing this. I seem to not remember participating in the act, though it is clear that I must have participated in the act. I have witnessed the same activity just as well as other people have witnessed in, in me. That sense is, is the sense of Karma Yoga. To work, to find that state and to continually remain in that state is a sense of Karma Yoga. And that's what we're trying to get to. In modern psychology, there is research on what's called a flow state. And so Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a researcher that had done this work. And the whole point of this was that people that are running, people are, that are doing activities, people that are doing creative acts, often find themselves in a state of flow where time seems to flow. They lose track of time, they lose track of themselves, and things just seem to happen. That too is, a, is being in a state of Karma Yoga. It does not require you to leave your families. It does not require you to leave your obligations. It does not require you to do anything other than simply surrendering the self to the higher higher order, 
to the to the higher self and then letting everything flow through us karma yoga does not sit independently of bhakti yoga and jnana yoga uh, often when when teachers talk about bhakti yoga or jnana yoga they tend to say well this is a path for this kind of person and that is a path for that kind of person that's not quite how it is understood in the gita and that's certainly not how it's understood in the wider tradition these are interrelated strands like like strands in a braid or as uh, ramakrishna paramahansa said uh, that you to make kheer which is a uh, you know, which is a milk uh, a sweet milk uh, preparation to make kheer, kheer you need milk you need rice and you need sugar and so you need the clarity the the uh, the clarity of milk the purity of milk which is uh, which is uh, gnana yoga wisdom you need the sweetness of bhakti and you need the robustness of karma yoga which is rice in that case so you need all three working together and the way even as it's explained in the gita it isn't that you do this or you do that these are all interrelated because to work in a state of surrender is to invoke both bhakti yoga and and karma yoga you can't work in a state of surrender if uh, you don't know whom to surrender yourself to for example and and so on so so i wanted to establish a few things up front and then i'll get into the mnemonic the first is karma yoga is part of the wider yoga tradition it is a means of approaching god and liberation through action it is one of the three paths and in the world as it stands today uh, it is uh, it should be the most followed path because we are looking for satisfaction we are looking for joy we are looking for connection we are looking for energy and enthusiasm all of those can be found through the path of karma yoga and so it pays to pay attention to what this is i'm going to pause here and and see if there are any reactions or questions okay okay uh vijay ji's question is how do you define karma yoga to an atheist without reference to the gita um so um so depends on what kind of atheist the person is if they if they uh, believe the universe exists uh, but they don't necessarily know if there is a creator or if they may they might be atheists that don't think that say that there's no bearded person 60 miles up in the sky and that's my brand of atheism most western atheists are of the latter variety where they tend not to think that there is a bearded angry person somewhere 60 miles up in the sky with with a retribution system of heaven and hell yes so um so those atheists are easy to work with um uh, if you other people that might uh, not have a firm stance on what um, atheism is or god is it doesn't matter if you believe in god or not the way um the way we look at um, uh karma yoga which is it does not it does not matter if you believe in god for the simple reason that if you feel that energy must flow through you then you have to understand what energy is you don't need to believe in god to experience that energy if you feel the that you must get satisfaction from work and satisfaction only comes from serving others it does not require it does not posit the the presence of a god of any shape or form or, or without a shape or form it doesn't matter so all the things that i'm talking about all the uh, all the experiences i'm talking about don't necessarily require um, a belief in god of any variety um, the gita itself you know the kashmir shaivism uh, school explains the gita uh, from their point of view and they don't necessarily think that krishna is uh, is god incarnate it it does not matter to their explanation neither for shankaracharya's bhashya does he assume that that is the case uh, and in those uh, interpretations they're not they're not the interpretation i'm using but they are you know they are well stand well understood interpretations that exist as well so uh, in general the idea of karma yoga uh, everything i'm about to describe to you none of these require a belief in god itself uh, that that belief is completely secondary or tertiary to the points i'm discussing and i'll i'll explain why i'm saying that as i'm talking through it okay uh the question kk ji you asked what karma gnana and bhakti and where does raj yoga sit um raj yoga sits in uh, swami vivekananda's exposition and all the schools that follow from him uh but not all schools follow from um 
uh, Swami Vivekananda's uh, sort of line of thinking. So they tend to go back to these three rather than the uh, uh, the Raj Yoga that he describes, the you know the royal way. Uh, that's uh, very directly something that Swami Vivekananda spent a lot of time talking about. Karma Yoga does apply Nirupama Ji to the professional world, and that's how I see what we are doing. That's how I see what we're doing with the Hindu Community Institute, which is really it's a school for Karma Yoga, and that and we do it because, uh, and I'll explain that. Uh, when you work, uh, why do you work? You, you don't necessarily just work for money. Uh, you know, there are countries, there are states in some countries where money comes to you because, you know, in Alaska, the government uh, makes money from oil. They send you money. We don't just work for money. And in the future, technology has come to a place where people will not need to work for money. I can guarantee that uh, that within some of our lifetimes, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years out, there will be a universal basic income in most Western economies. Why? That's just that's just exactly what's going to happen. We don't work for money, but we do work for purpose. We do work for satisfaction. We do work for uh, for joy and energy, right? Because other than that, it's a very low quality of life, living. If we don't find energy in our work, if we don't find connection in our work, if we don't find those in any aspect of our life, it's a very poor life indeed, right? And if you see the 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 um, in the West, I live in the West. I've been here you know twenty two years. Um, uh, the sense of negativity and this nihilism that has taken over, that everything is a machine, everything is purposeless, meaningless. Well, if everything is meaningless and life is meaningless, then maybe you're going to pursue. Uh, higher and higher sort of uh, you know satisfaction from narrow and narrower things eventually you know it's all going to be drug induced uh, um, uh, you know um, uh, uppers and downer induced uh, lives and that's a very terrible life because now we've outsourced our innermost experience to, to medicines to experiences that um, that are you know very uh, short lived and that's what i'm seeing in the west that uh, we have because we've walked away from the innermost experience, which is the subject of yoga, uh, we tend to have, we've become, we've become machines ourselves. And if we become machines, what is the point of living? Well, it might be, then people become, you know, the char worker philosophy. I'm not going to get into it today, but but that's uh, that's where we're going. So karma yoga applies to our professional world, absolutely. And, um, and that's why I've written the book, because I've come to the conclusion that if you're a professional in the modern world, then you're at a very precarious place from this point on in the future if you do not understand the principles of yoga. That's what I'm going to talk about in this section as well, which is it is imperative to understand a karma yoga. Why? Because if you're a leader, what is your job as a leader? It used to be your job as a leader was thinking complex thoughts or doing comp complex computations. No one cares about that anyway. Computers do that all the time. I can make an, a spreadsheet and, and take care of that part of the world. Leader's job is to lead. It is to, uh, it is to imagine a future that does not exist and lead people to it. It is to influence people to do things that they don't know, uh, you know why they're doing it, but they're still being influenced to do it. It is to, um, it is to, Give people space to learn and fail. These are the things that a leader is supposed to do. Now you tell me. Because everything else a machine will do. There's no question about it. Now you tell me, how, where are people learning these skills? No school teaches these skills. We are taught to doubt. And I'm, I'm giving away half my talk in this part, but I, but I hope this is meaningful. We are taught to doubt in the scientific system that we were all educated in, we are taught to doubt. There is no problem with that as far as I, I'm concerned. That's the scientific method. But we are not taught to believe. And that's why educated people make for poor leaders because they're always filled with doubt. They're always analyzing, paralyzing themselves, right? When you learn to doubt, you also have to learn to believe. But we are not taught to believe, we are taught to question everything. So what happens as a result is leaders can't lead without a sense of belief. Because what are you leading people to? A future that no one can see. 
right? You have to believe in that future. You have to convince other people to believe in your belief of that future. That's what a leader's job is. How is how are you going to conduct yourself if you yourself are filled with doubt? If you yourself don't have the capability to visualize a future, right? So you can see that with what's happening in the world around us, the destruction and distraction, the professional of the future has to be a karma yogi. If not, they're going to be slammed off the workforce simply because some machine will take over their work or they'll become low order uh, minion workers because it'll be just the last mile things that computers can't or don't want to do, right? We will become slaves to all that technology and this whole machine of, uh, of, of commerce that we are building with technology. I'm not, I mean, I live in Silicon Valley. I'm not painting a dystopian future. I'm saying that it is an inevitable future until we learn to apply Karma Yoga at work because with that, there's so much joy and so much meaning and purpose, but it is not taught in schools. And that's the problem. All right. Any other questions or comments before I give the entire talk away? I am to retrace my steps. You can unmute yourself and ask as well, if you like. All right. Moving right along. If there are questions again, you may please raise your hand or, uh, or, or just ask. I'm going to show you a mnemonic device. And I'm and just I'm showing you for a few minutes only, and then I talk through every one of these items. Naturally, you know what the wrist is, the palm is, the opposable thumb, the pointer, the middle, the ring, the pinky finger, right? These seven places are where we're going to hide all the information from today's talk. You can carry it with you, and I promise you, if you pay attention to my talk, you'll be able to conjure up the entire talk by just looking at your right or left hand. In this case, my, this is my left hand, obviously. All right, what are the ideas that we are encoding into our hand? Okay, these are Sanskrit words, and I will talk to you, I'll give you a, a verse reference as well, but I'll tell you what, what's going on here. Let me tell you first. I already told you the wrist carries time. Obviously, you carry your, your watch here. So keep the idea of time on your wrist. So far, so good. Now, the opposable thumb that we have allows us to be the most dominant ape that exists. Why? Right? Because we can grip things, learn things. And this ability to learn things is encased into our thumb. If you remember that, we're good to go. The pointing finger points, points at other things, but it also points at us. I'm going to talk about the sense of self uh, that comes out of uh, you know, the sense of me and my my purpose from the pointing figure. For example, you say, you do this, you do this. Well, what will you do myself, right? The middle finger, I need not say this. This is a quasi-religious talk. I will not refer to the middle finger or certainly show you the bird, but you know what the middle finger means, means in the West. And I'm using it in the same literal sense of the middle finger. The ring finger is often used to connect because that's how when you get married, you are connected. And we're going to use it in the sense of connection to each other. And the pinky often, you make a pinky promise to your children. And so a pinky is something that you promise you will do and eventually comes to be. So those are the seven things. You know exactly what these are because I'm using popular uh, notions. And the Sanskrit words for these are kalai for the wrist, Kaushalam for the for the for skill for excellence, kartala, which is the palm of the hand, is kartala, and, and then I'm going to encode the idea of swadharma in the first pointing finger, nishkam karma in the middle finger, samadrishti in the in the, uh, the ring finger, and shraddha or belief in the in the pinky finger. That's all the information you need to carry for those watching this later. I have verse references to the Gita over here. You can come back to this point of the talk and go look up. These are Bhagavad Gita verses. So, for example, it says Bhagavad Gita 250. That's chapter 2, verse 50. And this, of course, is Yoga Karma Sukhashanam. When, when I say non-doership, these are the three verses I'm referring to. When I say time and understanding the meaning and value of time, it is here. When I say to thine own self be true, I'm of course citing Shakespeare, but I'm going to talk about the idea of Swadharma in from this verse, 235. 
I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this is a famous verse and those that have even not heard the Gita will have known these verses. I'm going to talk about uh, um, being being un unimpacted by by uh, by success or failure yeah, in in this. And then Samadrishti, is, I'm going to look at this verse and, and Shraddha on 440. There are other references for Shraddha as well, but this is the one I'm using here. I see there's a question or comment. Is there a question or comment? There's some sound, so I was wondering. Okay, no sound. Perfect. So far, so good. All right. Let me talk through um, each of these quickly. So, so you get a sense of what Karma Yoga is. And uh, Vijayaji, I promise you, I will not refer to divinity as such uh, in my, my description of these. These should be able to, you should be able to talk to your grandkids, uh, you know, or neighbors and, you know, skeptical people and, and be able to explain it without having to invoke things that they will raise their eyebrows. At. I promise that. All right, let's go talk about the first thing, which is Swadharma. I am right-handed, Right. And when, when someone throws a ball at me, I will uh, essentially catch it almost always with the right hand. That is my dominant hand. I can use my left hand, but it's not my preferred hand. Now, what does that mean? It just means that I'm right-handed. It's just who I am. To understand the nature of our own selves, right? To understand in which direction our energies flow is extremely important in Karma Yoga. I'm beginning with the pointing finger here. This is two, This is uh, Bhagavad Gita chapter 2, verse 35. And in that verse, again, I'm not going to quote it, but essentially what Sri Krishna is saying that it is best to live and act in accordance with one's innermost nature than to work in somebody else's nature. Right? In fact, it is fearsome. To fearful uh, to, to, to work in somebody else's. Now, why is that the case? And in Karma Yoga, this is very important because your inner logic dominates and recurses. If you if you do things that you your inner logic does not agree with, you will eventually keep coming back to it. Right? For example, if I grew up driving in India, I'm driving on one side of the road, I come to the US, I have to retrain myself to drive on the other side. Right? Fortunately, I learned driving in Delhi, where you always drive on the wrong side of the road. So it turns out I learned driving exactly the right way. But for other people, there's retraining to be done. So you understand, Swadharma, understanding one's innermost nature is extremely important. And a lot of people that find themselves at the workplace, out at sea, and with no energy flowing through, is the, it's this reason which is that they haven't explored their sense of self and how to fully express their innermost self at work. They're caught in the wrong jobs because it either paid more or because uh, someone told them to do it or it's just fit. They're doing things that they don't wish to do. In either case, understanding one's innermost nature is essential in Karma Yoga because it's in accordance with our innermost nature that we have to act. Otherwise, we are not, the energy is not flowing through us. It is impeded by this lack of connection, right? It is artificial. We make mistakes. We always have to, you know, be caffeinated and incentivized and, you know, a carrot dangling in front of us to keep moving. It, the throughput of energy in this is, is net negative. Whereas the throughput of energy, if you find your bearing, is in many, many times over. A small input of energy can lead to a whole explosion of creative output if you are working in accordance with your innermost nature. So the first lesson to take away is innermost nature. Then we come to the thumb. The opposable thumb separates us from our monkey forefathers. But in this case, we're going to use the thumb uh, as, a, as a metaphor for learning. It turns out the world that we're, we've entered requires tremendous learning and relearning. Tremendous. But we haven't learned to learn. It turns out we've learned to remember, but we haven't learned to learn. And a lot of professionals are finding themselves out at sea for that reason, because everything I can tell you, I've, you know, like, like it was just, I've sold an AI startup. I can tell you that um, AI will, it can do wonders already. It will do more wonders in the future. Technology is getting so good that anything that can be predictable and done uh, repeatedly, you know that a machine will be able to do it, right? So 
what are humans going to do? We're going to have to learn new things, new skills, new ways of engagement. But how do we learn? We learn by making mistakes. We learn uh, by, uh, by going to, you know, learning with a specific attitude. And so learning to learn is an important thing. Why is this the case here? Why is it on this thumb? Is that yoga is excellence at work. Yoga karma sukhashalam. And this is the most important thing that when we do work that requires skill, it gives us tremendous joy for some time. And then it gets boring and you have to acquire a new skill. right? But at work, a lot of people just clock the hours. They're not applying skills. They're not learning to be excellent. And what happens is they are tuned. You know, they're, they're not enjoying their work. Um, the way I, I run my stuff, I, I deal with technology all the time. I make presentations all the time. I um, I take I take a, a unusually uh, ex excessive amount of interest in in all my tools, including, for example, I use fountain pens. You will not be able to see fountain pens. Why? I have lots of fountain pens. I'm a fountain pen geek. Why? Because it's a tool of my work. I write, uh, I think, for a living. And, and so it's important for me to have tools that I can, I can express myself in. The point is, this drive for excellence is an essential part of karma yoga. And it's an essential part of survival in the, in the modern workplace. All right, moving right along. Uh, to the palm of the hand. So this is in Hindi, the word, this is called a kartala. Kartala. And the sense of uh, this word we're going to use it is, is the um, uh, is the sense of non-doership. Karta, karta bhav, a karta bhav is what we are trying to engender. So let me explain what that means. When, um, there's a famous Bhagavad, uh, you know, okay, well, okay, let me give you this example. Uh, there's a, a gentleman in India who's known as the Metro Man. This is E. Sridharan. And he he created the, you know, the, um, I think he did the Konkan Rail uh, and then he did the Delhi Metro and several other metro stations. Practically impossible projects, engineering projects, but he was able to do them successfully, repeatedly, one after another. And he, um, he has on the back of his wall a very interesting saying. Uh, it's from the Yoga Vashishta and he says, Karyam karomi, nachat kinchit aham karomi. Which is to say, I'm going to translate for you, I perform the deed, but I'm not the one who does it. I perform the deed, but I'm not the one who does it. That sense only comes when, we're able, when we lose ourselves into the action. If we think we're doing it, then how much, you know, what is this puny body uh, capable of doing? What is the puny brain capable of doing not much right but it is divine energy divine energy that flows through us that is able to move mountains recognizing that is to be in a state of karma yoga recognizing that all the actions that go through us are essentially the actions of the divine acting through the 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 medium of the self it is hard to get to because we like the joy of recognition. We like being being recognized. We like being told of the work, uh, being good or not. We love that. I, I, I like it too. But I have, it has been my experience as well that things that I really enjoy doing, I will look back at those notes and I wonder who wrote this because I have no memory of doing it. I know I did it, I mean, I mean, I recognize it, but I have no memory of it. And that's the sense that we want to cultivate. It doesn't, it's not something you cultivate, but more recognize that anything that's, you know, all that divine energy that flows through us, all the action that we're putting out in the world, all the things that are falling into place, we're not the ones doing any of that. There's a very famous uh, Obama quote, but I'm not going to get into it uh, here, uh, but it's, it says the same thing. So anyway, we'll come back to it. Some other talk. Okay, let's move to the wrist of the hand. The wrist of the hand is where we have clock time. And and that's the sense uh, of, of um, um, that I'd like you to remember in Karma Yoga, which is, uh, what is time? Uh, for those who don't believe in God, uh, should also not believe in time, because what is time? You don't see time. 
you only measure the passing of time, but even that is through physical instrument. There is, in fact, if you look at consciousness and time are completely un uh, ununderstandable, non-understandable in modern times, uh, simply for this reason that they, or even gravity, it, it's not a physical thing. It's something else, but we don't know what it is. What is time? So in, in the Gita, Sri Krishna says, I am time. And the very famous, uh, 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 very famous Robert Oppenheimer quote, where he quotes uh, the Gita as well. He says, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The Sanskrit he's quoting is, is better translated as I am time. I am the world destroying time. Kalosmi, Lokakshaya, Krit, Prabhidham, right? So he, this is, and if you think about what time is, independent of your belief in God, is simply, it destroys and creates all the time. Time is a force that is undeniable, right? And understanding the role time plays in our activities. Time and timing play a tremendous role in our activities in the world. And just understanding this, becomes important. Knowing that we're just media means of an action that is inevitable because time will always run through. And you can see that where when, you know, when the time has come for something to happen, whether I do it or somebody else does it, it'll happen because that's the force of time that is acting through all our beings. Recognizing that becomes important. So in the verses that I'm citing, this is a very famous set of verses, 11, 32, and 33. It, it, in the second half, he says, look, go out, go do this battle, win all the, all the, uh, you know, um, the, the prosperity, enjoy your rulership, right? It's okay for you to, to, to be the means of action, knowing that I am the action. You, you are an instrument of this time acting upon things. So your wristwatch carries time and that's what the next idea was. All right, now we come to the middle finger, which for you know, you know uh, politeness reasons, I will not demonstrate, but you know what I'm talking about. The middle finger is really, uh, I want to invoke that in the sense of uh, a sense of failure that we carry in our hearts. Oh, if I do this, I'll fail. If I fail, what will people say? And if people say things, then my respect will drop, all of that things that, we, that hold us back from acting, right? And the most, one of the most famous verses of the Gita is, is this Karmarne Vavdhikaraste. What he's saying is that you have the right to your duties, but not to the fruits, right? And also, uh, if you act in a state of uh, yoga, yogastha kuru karmani, act in a state of yoga, then siddha siddha yo samabhutva, then whether you're successful, not successful, it's all the same. This is a very essential part of survival in the modern world because if you don't learn to fail, you're going to fail, right? And this, I live in Silicon Valley. This is a, uh, it has become now popular wisdom in Silicon Valley uh, to the extent that companies that don't run experiments are going to fail because the world is changing so fast that if we don't try new things, we're going to fail. The only way to succeed is to fail enough times until we figure out how things work, right? So don't worry about the outcomes. Think of the whole thing as a process. I'm going to try this, it doesn't work. I'm going to try it again a little differently. It doesn't work, I'm going to try it until I figure out how to make it work. Then I have excellence. You remember Yoga Karma Sukhashalam. So to acquire excellence, I need to have the sense that it doesn't matter if I succeed or fail. There are so many inputs that get into failure. My individual agency, my own action are a very small part of why things succeed. So I shouldn't be worried about whether things succeed or not. I should just continue to act because then I'm putting out energy into the world. And then some will succeed now, some will not succeed. Eventually, I'll learn to be excellent. So middle finger is, is, to, is to have this sense of equanimity at work all right um oh, sorry is to act in the state of yoga rather right yogastha guru karmani all right now to the ring finger easy one a uh, ring finger connects us and here uh, i want to talk about this in the context of what we're doing at the hindu community institute um, but before that i have to take you back in time how far back in time 
possibly six, possibly 10 million years ago. We are essentially depend, descended from apes, primates, monkeys. And if you look at ape societies, monkey societies, I grew up in Delhi, but my, my grandmother's home was in, uh, is in Lucknow. And in Lucknow, there are monkeys all around. And monkeys spend a third of their time grooming each other, you know, picking things off each other's back and eating them or take, supporting each other's babies or whatever it is that they're doing. They spend a third of their time grooming each other. They're a social species. And social species spend a lot of time doing things for each other. It's the hallmark of a society that works, right? Humans are the most dominant primate for the re simple reason that we are the most social species. We are not the strongest ape by a wide margin. Our brains are now smaller than our ancestors used to have, right? But we are a social species. The reason I tell you this is the incentive structure inbuilt into our physical physiology is this. The incentive structure is we get satisfaction from doing things for other people. There's a payoff for altruism, satisfaction, right? And that's built into us. But you look at, at the work, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we see the world, because of the over materialization of our thinking, we think that it's only money that matters. So people work for money, people that work for money don't necessarily get satisfaction from that money. How do I know? You can see that all the way around. Rich people often fall into alcohol or other personal problems because they're not getting that satisfaction. They need to take the edge off their otherwise uh, successful life. Why? Because they're not getting satisfaction. There's a famous Rolling Stones song, which is, you know, I can't get no satisfaction. It's the sign of our times. Why can't Mick Jagger get satisfaction? For the simple reason that if you're doing things for yourself, you're not going to get satisfaction. Your satisfaction is a blip. It goes away. The only way to get satisfaction built into our physiology, because we're a social species, is to serve others. But we live out our entire life not exercising, not tapping into the source of satisfaction. Unsatisfied, unhappy, unenergetic. The only way to tap it is to serve others. So when we started Hindu Community Institute, this was the vision that we started with, that the society has a lack of this satisfaction and it's breaking our societies apart. Because we ought to do things for each other because we are part of a common society. And that gives us joy, gives us purpose, gives us satisfaction. And not having it, having a mechanical materialistic society, it creates very fragile, very feeble, very over-individualized societies, which we can see all the way around us. How do you reintegrate societies? That glue that binds us together, that connection that binds us together is the service we do to each other. Not because we want something back, because we want to serve, because that's the only way to get satisfaction. So in order to do that, you have to look at everyone, Samadarshi. You have to look at everyone in the same view. Not that this is my, you know, this is my, per, you know, this person is more like me, that other person is not more like me, I'll serve the person that's like me. No, you serve everyone equally, right? Why? Because everyone's part of the same society. It's not even humans, non-humans also. You should serve all of society. In fact, the, the, the most primal drive that the Gita drives us to is this, right? Which is Loka Samgraha looking out for the, the improvement of the world he is the highest uh, drive that we have, but we don't tap into it. So, ring finger, seeing all as one, Samadrishti, we said. Now we come, come to the most interesting one, which is the pinky finger. Pinky finger, again, you make pinky promises to your children. Pakka, tomorrow I'm going to buy you, I don't know, this toy, right? Tomorrow is tomorrow, we'll see you tomorrow. The problem that people face now is we're filled with doubt. We're taught to doubt. We're not taught to believe. We have to rebuild that muscle by learning to believe. Not blind belief, right? But learning to believe. Why? In the Gita, the verse I cite says, look, people who are of a doubting nature, they suffer a downfall because for a skeptical soul, there's no happiness in this world or the next world. They're never satisfied. 
they can never see. And in fact, uh, that's where this is a very common uh, refrain all the way through the Gita, Gita, which is cultivating a sense of belief gives us one pointedness. Achal, Dhruv, those are the words being used, which is unmoving and single pointed versus Bhaushaka Anantascha, having hundreds, thousands of branched. The mind is, is multi-branched because we don't know which one will work. We, right? You can't create anything without believing. So learning to cultivate belief is an essential skill for the modern workplace. All right. And again, my longer talk has more details on this, but I want to just recap for us what those seven things are. And then I'll come to the end of this talk and I will, um, I will um, open it back for Q&A. Okay, to recap, uh, are you seeing are you seeing this? Okay, so now we, we encapsulate, we are carrying seven things away with us in today's talk, all right? Those seven things are a sense of time in the wrist, a sense of non-doership. I'm gonna just go right here with, uh, okay, where is this? Okay, no, here, okay. A sense of time in the wrist, a sense of non-doership in the palm of the hand, not infinity in the palm of the hand, which is nice, but non-doership. A striving sense of excellence forever in everything we do, being true to oneself in the pointing figure, signing up to a failure gym, learning that failure is an essential part of the process on the way to success, seeing all as one and learning to cultivate belief. Those are the seven things that you can carry back with you from today's talk on Karma Yoga. And I think now we're done and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions from you. For the longer talk, Shantiji, you have to join my course. <laughs> I'll be honored to, Garabhi. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so uh, the, I really enjoyed that. Uh, thank you very much. Sure, sure. We have a whole institute running on uh, on the back of these uh, things. Which is, uh, my right. talk is a small part of it, but the whole institute is the counselor of, you know, Hindu Community Institute. And the course is a counselor of Hindu tradition, where our objective is to let all of us, we, we think our tagline is, look, finish your, complete your education. This is the stuff we weren't taught, but we have to be taught because it's not that we've acquired it in yeah. this generation, right? Over hundreds or thousands of generations, we've collected this information about how, how to live in this world, how to live a more satisfied, deeper life, but we don't know how to access it. Our so our education isn't complete. And that's why we designed the course to complete our education. So uh, that was just one of those word from our sponsors deal. All right, now we're, we're up for questions and comments and your feedback. I'd appreciate your feedback as well. Thank you so much, Gauravji. That was an eye-opener. Um, and I think I can provide some links to your YouTube talks as well to the others that sure. they're mm -hmm. interested. Uh, yeah, Shanti she is one of the community leaders here in Canberra. And we have Vijay Arora Ji. He is again a karma yogi, as you're mentioning. Uh, he does free online yoga sessions uh, oh, three yeah. or four times a week. Uh, he mm -hmm. was also one of our speakers. He spoke about power of the mind meditation mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. Wonderful. Um, and we have Nirupama Ji from our group, uh, Hindu community. And Ionan is a uh, Pacific uh, Women's Group Leader. Uh, so we have all these people. I'm so happy they joined. Um, and I could relate to your, what you were saying about excellence and doing things. Um, but as I was listening, I was wondering, Gauroji, nowadays, not in my time, I'm much senior, People change jobs frequently, and one of the reasons given is they are dissatisfied with their working environment. And the other thing that came to my mind was also about these uh, performance ratings we have at work, sometimes every six months or sometimes once a year. Uh, and one public service department where I used to work I used to be quite perturbed by it. One of the ratings was meeting expectations. And I would think whose expectations and in what way. Uh, so can you throw some light on these two? Um, if you can, I mean, 
as a hmm. host, I shouldn't be asking the question. So I would rather, if you address the others, um, yeah, yeah, that's the preference. Yeah, in the wide arc of one's careers, right? The the a focus on short term performance ratings tends to um, tends to be uh, quite disastrous because what happens is. Uh, we are keeping our nose, eyes in on the ground and, and walking. We're going to hit a wall at some point, right? Uh, so you have to ha look at the long term and focus on building excellence. And excellence will show through in work. Um, and so I want to be clear. If you're cultivating excellence at work, then it will show through your, in your work and you will meet expectations and then some, right? Opportunities will find us. Uh, and that's very clear because in work, we're always looking for the good people. We're all, always looking for the sharp people. We're always looking for the enterprising, energetic people, right? And those will ex expose themselves to their, their work, right? So um, that's the way I, I see the world. It used to be, in fact, worse where because organizations were more uh, hierarchical and more, uh, um, more stationary, not, not as dynamic, that if you caught if you were caught in the wrong lane, then you could be really far behind in your career because there's nothing going on. Now what's happening is because industries are changing, companies are changing, technology is changing, jobs are changing. There's so much flux that you can't be caught behind the wrong people for too long. You can always move and and get a you know a, a more appropriate lane for yourself. That's the way I, I look at careers uh, in general, and. Uh, one of my articles I'd written on LinkedIn was, you know, don't let your career flatline. Uh, ups and downs are going to happen in any career and ups and downs are both fine uh, in any career. Uh, uh, because again, any flatlining in, in any movies, you know, any Hindi movies, you know, if you flatlined, you're dead. So you want to go up and down in your career. It's all right. So have a long term view, I think, is, is the, the thing I'd say. As far as people uh, looking for better places to work, because the culture is not good. That is true. In fact, a lot of people leave because of culture. And especially now the great resignation is happening. A lot of people are leaving because they don't like the culture. But the day, reason they don't like the culture may also be that uh, they join the company for the wrong reasons. Right? Uh, if you join for the wrong reasons, you're going to find those reasons around as well. Right? If you join for money or, uh, you know, just incremental promotion then you might not find the culture. You have to find your people where you're able to express yourself and find yourself. It takes doing, but it is possible to do it. If that's the way I look at it. That's the advice I give on the, in the at work. Kekeji, your hand is up. Uh, hello, Naste. Thank you for a very inspiring talk. It was really interesting. Um, I just have a couple of questions. One is, like even, even though we are very excellent in what we do, and most Indians are, you know, wherever we go and work, we are quite uh, hardworking and we put our all into it. So even though we may be quite excellent, but sometimes we can become victims of the uh, circumstances, basically if there is office politics and, um, you know, they don't recognize you despite you and you know, the clients and everyone appreciates you, but then the key people who need to appreciate you, they don't for whatever reason. Sometimes I always think it's uh, to do more with their insecurities than anything about our performance. So, you know, but there's always other opportunities. So we go on, you know, we move on and we do better. That's no issues. Uh, what I want to ask you is, um, I mean, like um, JTG said, like, you know, I'm senior too, but there are youngsters these days when they are going through their high school and early years of their university. Um, you know, sometimes it's very difficult for them to pick what they want to do with their lives. Uh, you mentioned about passion because it's very hard for them to understand like what is it that they really want to do, where they can get that immense satisfaction later in their career. So they are very so they just go and they are driven by the society expectations and parental expectations, and they go on to pick a career which is lucrative rather than that is soul satisfying. So uh, what kind of guidance you think you can throw to such people to pick something that will be uh, that they can identify their passion? My experience in this KKG has been that the problem is that not that we have picked the wrong careers. The problem is that we are not taught how to explore our inner experience. You know, the song that that is needs to be sung from inside. We don't know what that song is. We don't know how to hear it. And because we don't know how to tune into ourselves, we pay attention to outside, outside signals. 
and and that's that's i think the the deeper underlying problem i think with our children we need to help them cultivate the sense of self cultivate the sense of this you know if i ask somebody if i ask you this question how are you doing your answer will guaranteed be i'm doing fine thank you it's just what we say right but do you really know how you're doing and do you know how to tune into your own inner experience and only then will we be able to sense that you know what i'm really enjoying this i'm really enjoying that let me do more of this and see if i'll enjoy it a little bit more right and then that's how you get to cultivate a sense of what we enjoy and what we don't enjoy when i was a kid i had no sense of this right and um, and then you know uh, my joke was that uh, you know i was sitting on a wall they gave me an engineering degree i went in a crowd to you know a test i did well in the test they gave me an mba degree right the point is we weren't thinking we didn't know what was going on uh, and uh, we ended up in careers uh, uh, um, i mean i have done well professionally i'm not complaining i'm just saying that it would have helped to know what i'm really good at and 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 double down on that or head in that general direction yeah, if not immediately but over the long haul that's i think what kids need to be taught now especially now when everything is in flux it's important for us to teach young children young people how to cultivate the sense of enjoyment in what they're doing nirupama ji your hand is up yes karachi i what i am seeing these days like i have research with students who me working and i am just seeing that all these young people are they they are most of the time they are lost in virtual world they they more rely on something like instant instructions and they will follow but they are not like driven from inside don't remember thing so how you how to cultivate this sense of karm yoga in either through the university programs or i as supervisor i am really finding it very hard we have regular to be this given but in case for people who are like we are here in western world and we can like we can choose jobs we can easily go from one job to another if they are it is not set it is fine or if we are not relating to but there are people in other countries who have to stick to one job and for sir just really to provide bread for their family so what's for those people so um, so you know in the web of obligations we have to honor it right we, if if we have to take care of a family we have to take care of a family you can't say i'll follow my heart and and do that right um but even in the work that that we are doing uh, i think the sense of sadharma is is not really about varna which is your choice of career uh, but also how you approach your work right and you can still find ways to enjoy your work now i'll give you an, a completely unrelated example but you know there are uh, you know conventional traditional societies have songs for each trade right so you know so the, if you're driving a horse is a tick tock tick tock tick tock sound and you'll have a song around that right or if you are a jail crew which is a famous thing right there's a certain beat to your movement right why is that the case because you can sing even when you're doing you know manual drudgery right and that allows you to enjoy it that allows you to find uh, that sense of community right it's not necessarily only the context of work how we approach that work is also important if you approach it with a sense of uh, dislike then no energy will flow and we will have to goad ourselves to work every day and then yeah, no one's happy with that situation but even if it's unpleasant work the the pleasantness is here in the heart we can find ways to make it pleasant right a famous example yeah, that's I song. think that's what yeah. I think that's what we have lost I, I see my uh, when they were good for gate but these days everybody i don't know what they are running for always they want to find the perfect thing which is probably never never exists yeah yeah i agree yeah i agree good <clears throat> any other questions or comments i i really thank you for the opportunity for to to see you and to have this talk i appreciated the conversation as well thank you any other questions or comments
Guruji, I just have got one question. Uh, you know, just the initial talk, you said that the world is in a great flux. Okay, we have, we are a doubtful society. We never believe anyone. Okay, I got a copy of Gita with me. I believe in Gita really, but I just wanted to ask you a question. <clears throat> I have lost hope personally, except that, that the society, whole society is now doubting each other. Unless we can come up with a, a computer program like a Facebook or something like that, completely lost hope. Uh, with a, I'm I, in that age now. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I actually, I have not lost hope. I, I actually find purpose in this, this disarray. Because, um, <clears throat> see, you know, for the transitions to happen, always there has to be yeah. flux. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I can't build a better society unless the previous order is ready to collapse. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think of it in a far more optimistic uh, point of view where I find purpose. Look, it isn't my purpose or your purpose, Vijay. Right. I feel that, look, in my birth, I'm not the first genius guy to come up with these thoughts. These are not my thoughts. Right. I've inherited these thoughts from an, a long change of chain of being. Right. And that chain of being exists. And this is the reason these thoughts are here, because when societies are in flux is when you can do something to create better societies. When societies are not in flux, then there is less hope, I would mm -hmm. argue. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully something comes out good. <laughs> so, you know, we'll go through terrible times, but maybe not in my lifetime, but in future lifetime, it'll, it'll come out for the much better because uh, that's what uh, that's the only belief we are going to work with right if we, if i believe nothing will happen then i won't act so i have to believe that you know mm -hmm. a, a new age will come out of where the yogic wisdom and all this wisdom that we have in all the societies can be put to use to make better societies mm -hmm. right my my other way of approaching this is of course i'm a, i'm a, you know i'm a bhakt so my sense is look everything is god's so if this, you know, all my enemies are also uh, the same, same God, right? It's his, his, he has taken this shape and that shape and this shape. Right? Why should I have any sense of enmity with them? It's just guna guna shuvartante, right? It's just to create this friction and it, it gets the better out of us. I try to think like that sometimes. <laughs> When nice. I feel disturbed, it's all him. <laughs> and even when someone's doing very well, I feel very glad because I feel that's also part of the same soul. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I think uh, I'm like you, Garaji, optimistic. I think the world is a much better place now than it was 50, 100, 200 years ago, I think. Yeah. Overall, I think, um, it, in every aspect, I think. Um, anyway, that's that's Nirpa your hands are up. I know if, if these are newly yeah, up. Yeah, just or... one more thing. Ji. You know, uh, we, I mean, if we think like we are puppets and uh, God is the puppeteer, you know, who um, makes us do things that we are uh, expected to play the role, you know, that we are expected to play, um, then the world is like, a, you know, the Kali Yuga, where everything, so... You know, I'm just trying to understand the difference between uh, the free will that we are supposed to have and uh, the fatalistic society that we are supposed to believe in. So the way we are moving towards the, you know, the Kali Yuga, is it also the will of God then? If uh, if it is not out of our free will, so mm -hmm. is he destining us to behave in the entire world in such a way that it is being driven towards Kali Yuga? And you see what I am, you, you sure, understand sure. what I mean? Yeah, sure. yeah. I find that ironically, we have come to a place where positions have reversed and uh, the West is um, is against free will and, and the, our, our Hindu tradition is completely pre free will oriented. So <laughs> we've come to a place where we have exchanged positions. Uh, Hindus are by far non-fatalistic, even though that is the popular press. And, and generally people, even Hindus don't know that, that to be the case, but in general, uh, the whole point of the Gita is that uh, look, free will, free will exists. The whole point of the Gita is that free will exists. Otherwise, there's no need for the Gita, right? If Arjuna had no choice in his action, then what is the point of going through 700 verses over 18 chapters? Meaningless. Arjuna will do what he needs to do anyway, right? He's a puppet. But the whole point of the Gita is that he has free will and he must exercise it in the right manner, right? 
that's the way to, I approach it. Um, is the society becoming more fatalistic or going to Kali Yuga? Uh, I think the society has been in Kali Yuga for a while. And in fact, the name of my book is based on Kali Yuga, which is the age of destruction and distraction, right? Which is, it's a definition of Kali Yuga, right? Which is um, uh, destruction and, and, and uh, Kalesh. So which is distraction. So anyway, so that's, uh, I think we are in Kali Yuga and we will come out of it. Uh, I feel that every technology and we are, I argue in the book that we are a cyborg. We are a biology technology hybrid. We are not, we cannot survive without technology. You might disagree with that, but I'll prove otherwise in, in a few seconds. Uh, I can't walk around naked. I have to wear clothes. I can't eat raw food alone. I have to cook food, right? Those are technology. Clothes are technology. Language is technology. The whites of my eye communicating with you is technology. The dental arcade of my teeth designed to eat pre-cooked, uh, pre-digested, as in, as in cooked food. All of this is technology shaping my biology, right? I am a completely domesticated cyborg in that sense, and so are you. So we are, we have a very positive relationship with technology, is what I'd like to say. We can handle fire, we can handle metal, we've handled language, we will handle all the new technology that's coming out. It will just take a bit of transition to get to the other side. Thank you. Gauravji, we'll finish with that, uh, mm -hmm. if I have your permission. Thank you very we much. We have taken much longer than <laughs> what you had uh, agreed to uh, give us. I know it's late evening there. Once again, I express my gratitude to you, Gauravji, and I hope you will come again uh, soon on our network. Um, and to all others who joined, thank you very much. Uh, I'm planning to have some talks on homeopathy and Ayurveda, uh, so I will be in touch. Uh, namaste. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.